how do we quantify uh, everything that we possibly can about our food? So not just the, the macronutrition, like the calories and the protein and the fat, but what about other types of nutrients that are in our food but aren't on the nutrition label, like polyphenols, like omega-3 fatty acids? Um, I want to know about that stuff because I can guarantee you that the way that my almonds are farmed produces more of those beneficial compounds than you know, almonds that are being strip mined in the soil and, and sprayed with a bunch of chemicals. This is Evolve CPG, a community of purpose-driven brand leaders who not only believe in better, but actively pursue it. That's better products, better brands, and better leadership for a better world. You can join our online community right now where we're going further, faster together at community.evolvecpg.com. Join us. I'm your host, Gage Mitchell, founder and creative director of Modern Species, a sustainable brand design agency helping better brands grow and scale their impact. On this episode, we're speaking with Tim Richards, founder and CEO of Philosopher Foods, about the benefits of raw, sprouted, and regeneratively grown foods, and the challenges of running a premium food product company. Hey everybody, I'm Tim Richards. I'm the founder, CEO, and owner of Philosopher Foods. At Philosopher Foods is a nut butter company currently that's focused on creating the most delicious, nutritious, ethical, and ecological nut butters that we can possibly produce. Currently, we do a line of uh, coconut butter, sprouted almond butter, and chocolate versions of both. Our real specialty and our focus is on creating craft nut butters as opposed to commercially mass-produced nut butters. And what that means is we're grinding in small batch stone grinders. So it's a low speed, low temperature, traditional form of food processing. Got about a 30,000 year species history with uh, stone grinding as a form of processing. And so we're trying to stick true to our roots and um, keep it with biologically adapted forms of processing. And yeah, looking forward to being on the show today and having a great stimulating conversation. Nice. Thanks for joining me. We've been trying to get this show together for a little while now, so I'm excited to finally got it in the books and we're here. We're talking. It's going to be awesome. <laughs> and um, where I want to start is Philosopher isn't just the brand name, but it also comes comes to you honestly because you started out as a philosophy major in in school. So I'm curious, what what about philosophy drew you in in the first place, and why did you decide to uh, major in that? Yeah, that's a great question. Thanks for asking. So yeah, for philosophy, I I had a lot of burning questions um, when I was a teenager. Let's say I was. I was uh, particularly existentially angsty. Um, <laughs> so uh, starting when I was about 16, um, I just started getting a lot of burning questions, and they really uh, bothered me. And I was taking a European history class in high school, and I was just learning about a lot of things that I didn't understand, like um, you know various injustices with the Catholic Church and burning people at the stake and all this kind of stuff. And I'm, it just really, something about it um, really, really triggered me on a deep, I almost want to say genetic level. It's almost like I could remember my ancestors being persecuted in those ways. Wow. And it made me infuriated. And so um, I actually started writing um, as a way to process all these thoughts and feelings. I didn't write until that point, And I just, literally stay up all night writing, think my thoughts wow, and feelings okay. out. And so that actually led me to doing a complete U-turn in my trajectory in school. Like I was thinking to be a science and math kind of person, you know, getting into computer programming, you know, all the well-established career tracks where I might have actually <laughs> made a lot of money. Totally. Um, <laughs> uh, but I ended up, you know, dropping my AP physics, dropping my AP calculus and like doing an independent study in philosophy and um, got really into literature and writing. And so, yeah, I, I basically did that in the tail end of my high school career. And then when I got into college, I still had a ton of burning questions. And um, 
I started exploring them in uh, all kinds of classes, but mostly philosophy. Uh, at the end of the day, it was what I felt like was um, best allowing me to pursue these deep burning questions of mine. Okay, so those burning questions struck you when you were younger and you started writing. Do you have you ever gone back and looked at any of those writings, like, or have you published any of them? <laughs> you know, um, I have way more journals than I care to admit. Um, like I said, <laughs> I've been writing almost daily since I was sixteen. So for Dang. you know more than half my life at this point, I've been writing, and I have a lot of journals that I would like to go back and read. Some of them I have done that, and um, it's definitely interesting to see where my brain was <laughs> at that point. Um, yeah, it's like a time I haven't capsule. published any of them. Um, I did end up. What's that? It's like a time capsule. Really. I miss what you said. <laughs> yeah, it is totally. It's like here's my internal subjective evolution recorded on paper. <laughs> nice. So um, I ended up. I did write a senior thesis um, on environmental ethics um, that ended up getting published in a journal on sustainability uh, after I graduated. But other than that, I haven't published anything, uh, at least not formally. I did, I did have a blog. In fact, you can go right now to sustainablephilosopher.wordpress.com, and nice. you can read. Um, I actually had a travel year after I graduated in philosophy, and I was awarded a travel year to study community approaches to sustainability, oh. uh, which was a self-designed project I created for the Thomas J. Watson Foundation. And basically, they gave me $25,000 to travel the world for a year studying eco-villages, permaculture farms, and transition town movement. Nice. That's pretty sweet. Yeah. I don't know why I didn't think of something like that. Cause I, didn't, I didn't travel <laughs> after, right after college, but I think it was about three or four years after college. My then fiancé and I, at, the, at, our, at the time, both were just getting really burnt out on our jobs and like feeling like there must be more to this because we weren't like doing anything sustainable, impactful or whatever. And it just felt like kind of a waste of time and resources. So we just took mm. some time off and went and traveled. And I didn't even nice. think to look for like study grants or anything else like that. That's brilliant. But we ended up yeah. packing the whole year of travel for two people. I think our end, end budget ended up being like $18,000. So. That's uh, awesome. Five thousand dollars for one person. You must have been traveling <laughs> high on the hog there, luxurious. <laughs> <laughs> you could say that. Yeah, I, um, <laughs> I was actually, I was spending a lot of money on doing things like taking permaculture courses and nice. taking an eco village design course, and um, you know, so that stuff was definitely pricey. It definitely added up to do all that cool stuff, but uh, it was money well spent. Um, nice. Yeah, I guess it was, you know, I was in college, I got into environmental activism, and that was kind of my, those were the issues that spoke mostly to me uh, when I was thinking about the big picture of the, the life and earth and what are we doing here on earth. To me, uh, one of the things that bothered me most was like, well, why haven't we figured out how to live well on this planet that we're uh, seemingly an indigenous to? Um, and so, you know, or that was a big question why have we forgotten it? Yeah. Yeah, have we? I know, right? Well, I guess it depends on whose theory you buy into of evolution. <laughs> yeah. But uh, you know, if you believe in panspermia, then you believe that we came from outer space and just happened to colonize here. But <laughs> uh, yeah. most people believe that we originated on this Earth. And um, and if that's the case, you know, why why is it that we've like had so many millions and billions of years to evolve here, but we haven't really figured out as a human species uh, how to live well on the planet um, in a way that's biologically adapted to living on a living planet. And so, you know, I was into environmentalism and I was like, okay, cool, solar panels, you know, all that good stuff. But like, what about how we actually live? And so that's what got me thinking about this question of lifestyle. Like, what are we doing on a daily basis? And what are the what are the effects of that lifestyle on this planet? And um, that's really what led me into this rabbit hole of uh, permaculture and eco villages, because it's kind of like, uh, in for example, in eco villages, you're basically trying to live in an environmentally adapted way full time, right? You're like you're not just having the solar panels in your house, but you know <laughs> yeah. you you probably have a naturally built house that is made using materials that came from the planet 
probably don't have a lot of added poisons or carcinogens in those building materials. Um, the house is probably modestly sized. It probably fits well into your landscape. You probably have a garden. Um, and, you know, there's, I, I don't know that we were like, I, I was just feeling like we weren't meant to live um, in these isolated, atomized ways, uh, so disconnected from each other in nature. And so yeah. I wanted to explore these movements where people also believe that. And instead of just thinking about it, they were actually living um, in an applied way to see, you know, how do we actually live differently? Nice. That's so cool. that That's... was that was kind of what I was thinking about and doing um, when I was 23. And then just a couple of years later, uh, ended up starting this company when yeah. I was 26. Well, did you publish kind of the end results of that uh, year of study slash learning? If so, maybe we yeah, can so, pop in the show notes yeah, or something. Totally. Yeah. If you go in the, the blog I mentioned, Sustainable Philosopher, um, then I actually wrote about not just kind of my daily experience, but I did um, a recap of the whole year. And I was actually nice. forced to do it in five pages. You know, it seems oh, like five pages isn't, isn't very much, but if you, you use think like about trying six to point type. <laughs> <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> You try to condense a year of experience into five pages. It was actually quite yeah. challenging. I um, it. So that's on there. There's a lot of pictures from it as well, and um, yeah, you can see what I was up to uh, okay. twelve years ago. Cool. <laughs> I'm gonna have to dive into that. Sounds interesting. But to your point, that journey kind of led you into what you're doing now, where you, you know, a lot of what you're doing is around being more in harmony with nature, right? This this nut butter company that focuses on regenerative gly glyphosate free and all that kind of stuff. However, I'm just curious, like there's so many different paths you could have gone down, different food companies or different kind of businesses you could have launched. What pulled you into nut butter specifically? And was it kind of sprouted foods or nut butter that kind of pulled you in first? Well, um, so I, I did start in the environmental nonprofit sphere at first. Um, so I was doing a lot of conservation work. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, I liked the nonprofit model, but I saw some weaknesses with the nonprofit approach. Um, and, you know, I actually, um, I, I ended up moving to Davis, California to work for an environmental nonprofit. And um, ironically enough, they, they weren't that good at, um, the social aspect of the thing. So like we were doing really great ecological work trying to conserve nature, but the social like uh, off office work culture even wasn't super friendly or, you know, well adapted to treating people in a good way. Hmm. And so um, I ended up getting fired for standing up against my boss when she kind of yelled at me and my coworker. And, um, and I just, you know, after that, it sort of sent me on a search because like I knew I didn't want to do that anymore, and um, so I, I started actually working doing uh, product demonstrations for Harmless Harvest, wow. and um, that was actually my intro into the natural products world. Um, because and during my travel year, I I loved coconut water, and then I tried their coconut water, and it was the first time I had coconut water that actually tasted like coconut water that I was drinking in India. Um, <laughs> okay, nice. so I loved it, fell in love with it right away. It was an easy product for me to sell because I super believed in it and I used it all the time. And it was a whole foray into the world of organic and natural food products that, uh, up to that point, you know, I, I was a co-op shopper and I ate organic and things like that, but it never really occurred to me that I could be involved with a business, um, you know, that was selling that, those kind of products. Yeah. And so it, it, it just kind of triggered something in mind, like, okay, this is a new potential path. At the same time, I um, actually started, started studying to be a holistic health coach through the Institute for Integrative Nutrition. And so I was learning about all kinds of cool stuff like sprouting and how it's, it's a good way to process your nuts, grains, beans, or seeds to make them more digestible and more nutritious. And it actually triggered a memory for me. In college, I was a raw foodist. And so I was, I was doing all kinds of crazy stuff. Like I was you know, sprouting buckwheat and dehydrating it into my own buckwheat cereal. I was, wow, you know, nice. uh, grinding up almonds, making my own fresh almond milk to put on the buckwheat cereal. And then when I would make the almond milk, I'd strain out the pulp and I would um, like add coconuts and coconut oil and carrots and raisins and make my own almond bread. And 
put oh, in man. the dehydrator and so like all this kind of stuff and um i was like wait a second i i have all the equipment like i should start sprouting almonds again because that i remember i did that and that was really cool so i sprouted some almonds and it was just like oh wow these are the best almonds man this is delicious and yeah. um i actually was like man this would make a really good almond butter so i made it into almond butter and indeed it was the best almond butter i ever had in my entire life sprouted almond butter and I think the difference was like when I was in college, I was on the East Coast. And so I didn't necessarily have those fresh California almonds to work with. Okay. But being in Davis, uh, California, the, the raw inputs I was using were so fresh and so high quality, just straight from the farmer's market, unpasteurized California non pareil organic almonds. It was like life changingly delicious. Oh, man. And so. I was like, you know, making it for myself. I was living with a bunch of housemates at the time. And they were like, dude, this is the best almond butter ever. Like, you got to make this a business. <laughs> I was like, yeah, we'll see. You know, I'm 25. I'm trying to figure out what to do with my life. I might be doing this health coaching thing, doing this food product demonstration thing. Like, we'll see. And uh, they ended up passing a California Homemade Food Act in January 2013. And I learned about it and I realized, wow, for for 75 bucks, I could start this business in my home kitchen, literally. Okay, not bad, yeah. And, you know, I just, um, one day my housemate came up to me and he was like, dude, I want to buy your almond butter. And he just shoves cash in my hand. And it was kind of like, whoa, oh, interesting. <laughs> There's like a real demand for this. Yeah. <laughs> and he's like, would you rather see more clients or sell more jars of almond butter? And um, he was saying uh <laughs> and that kind of hit me. It was like, okay, well, there's a clear demand here. Um, there's clearly a finite amount of client that I can see. But uh the amount of product that I could sell, you know, that's potentially infinite. I mean, obviously we live on a finite planet, but you know what I mean. Yeah, there's like yeah. a lot scalable. more potential customers for a food product company than there is for a one on one coaching company. And so um, I ended up, yeah, just kind of sitting with it and, um, I ended up really deeply meditating about it actually for a number of months. Journaling, I'm, I'm sure. One, <laughs> absolutely. Yeah. Journaling and thinking and all of it. And one night I was laying there doing some yoga before bed and, um, I was laying there in Shavasana getting ready to go to sleep. And all of a sudden, I, I got what I describe as a download from the universe. And literally, I, I just got chills in my whole body as I had this insight that my life's purpose at this time is to create a sprouted almond butter company that teach people about the importance of sprouted food and changes the way that almonds are grown to move from degenerative monocultures to regenerative polycultures. Nice. And that was it. That's it was pretty like sweet my download to get. flash of insight, super specific. Um, and I sort of had this whole vision that unfolded. It was about a three hour vision uh, that was just showing me the next five years of my life, super clearly starting this company. Um, I kind of got what I describe as like operating instructions in a way, like not like a specific business plan of like total addressable market and all this yeah. kind of like <laughs> numbers stuff. But like a feeling, right? I could see my life five years into the future. I could feel selling the product. I could feel making the difference. And it just became completely clear to me. It clicked on every cell of my body that this was the answer for how do I combine my passion for philosophy, for food, for environmental activism, all into one project that I can use to actually concretely make a difference in the world and make a living that's aligned with my values. That's beautiful. It reminds me a little bit of this book I just finished reading called Recursion. And it's all about uh -huh. this idea of multiple timelines and like uh, when certain timelines kind of overlap or catch up with each other, all of a sudden you get this download of this other life you lived or like the life you're about to live or, you know, something like that. So it's kind of cool to like think about like, like you said, it, you just got to see the next five years and knew what your, your orders were from there. Like you could see it clearly and you, you knew you had just had to move forward with that. Yep. It's awesome. Yeah. I feel like so many people would love to have an experience like that. I think part of where um, a lot of people get this feeling 
of being lost in the world is because they don't have true clarity of of what they're really passionate about or where their skills would be best suited or or anything else like that. Like for me, it's I've got too many things I'm excited about, and so the hardest part is like deciding which ones are worth the time to pursue. But every once in a while, like you said, you get that moment of clarity where you're like, oh, this is how it all plugs together. I get it now. And then you can like move forward in a much more strategic, clear path, knowing that what you're doing all makes sense. But for so many people, I feel like we kind of live in this state of kind of overwhelm and confusion of not knowing where we're supposed to go next. And then, you know, seeing all the media projecting all these things that we're supposed to value, but maybe we don't, but maybe we should. And like, just makes us really kind of messed up in our minds. Totally. Yeah. So that's maybe a, another reason why people, more people need to meditate is just to, to clear and quiet down all those other voices so that you can open yourself up to get that download from the universe. Yep. I definitely resonate with that. And I, I kind of feel like I was just listening, yeah. you know, like I was listening and asking questions like, what is my life's purpose? What am I here to do? How do I um, create a life's work that allows me to not only make money, but also to uh, imbue my vision for the world into the planet in a meaningful way? And um, yeah, after all those thinking, listening and asking questions, I was just guided to that moment. And it was literally like a flip of a switch, like Next day, I started doing it, and that was like that was over nine years ago. Nice. I've been doing like, it every single day since. Bought the seventy-five dollar <laughs> license, and off you went. You already had all the equipment, so. <laughs> exactly, I had it all in the, with me from college, um, and so yeah, just just it all clicked, and here we are. <laughs> yeah, and one of the points that you made, I guess, multiple points is, you know, the difference between the New York almonds versus that fresh. Um, California almond, but then also in that vision was shifting away from extractive or degenerative to more regenerative models. So I'm pretty sure, I don't know for sure, but I'm pretty sure you have like your own direct source. I don't know if you own the farm directly or if you just work directly with a farm, but I know that you have um, a specific direct source that you pull from that is kind of regenerative. How did that relationship get started or, or how did you end up with a farm if you if you actually own the farm? So that was part of the download was to vertically integrate. That's not a part of the vision that I've been able to manifest yet. Okay. Um, so we are sourcing from third-party almond orchards here in California. Uh, they're all certified organic. And you know, they, they source from several different orchards throughout the state. Um, some of them definitely qualify for regenerative practices. However, um, there's no there's no regenerative organic certified almonds on the market yet. Um, that being said, we are working with our supplier to get regenerative organic certified acreage, as well as be better certified acreage. Um, unfortunately, what happened is they they were about to commit at least. Um, two farms of theirs to getting that cert both of those certifications this year in time for the fall harvest. Yeah. However, uh, we kind of had a cold snap mm. here in California yeah. and unfortunately an early freeze wrecked the crop of those two particular regenerative orchards. Um, so ironically enough, climate change has taken regenerative organic certified almonds off the table for us um, at, at least for this harvest year with this supplier. Wow. Um, that being said, you know, we, we have a great relationship with the supplier and there's always next year's crop where hopefully they'll have enough product that we can actually get some of it certified. Okay. Well, how'd you go about um, then finding the, the right suppliers who were willing to work with you and kind of move in this direction? So, yeah, we've we've been working for a long time since at least 2015 to actively try to seek regenerative almonds. Um, and at the time, I was actually involved with uh, my buddy Ethan Rowland, who now works for How Good, if you know How Good. Yeah. Um, they're doing a lot of awesome work around the creation of regenerative supply webs. And at the time, he had his own permaculture consulting company. And 
they were actually consulting Lush Cosmetics um, on the creation of regenerative supply webs. And Lush was looking to create um, regenerative almonds because they wanted regenerative almonds um, orchards for their almond oil that they used a lot of. Okay. Um, so he was working with Lush, and then he was essentially uh, coming out to California with Lush to do a regenerative almond scouting trip. And he invited me along for the ride. And <clears throat> it was during that trip when I first met um, our current supplier. And it was just clear from the get go. It was like, oh, wow, we're speaking the same language. You care about organic local food. You shop at the farmer's market every week, just like me. Um, uh, you guys are running your business in a highly integral way. Um, so it's, it's actually a family owned company. It's been over 40 years, family owned. It's a woman owned company. Uh, they were some of the first organic almond farmers in the state of California. And um, everyone thought they were crazy <laughs> back in the day. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> literally, they were surrounded by conventional farms and all their names were like, what the heck are you guys doing? Um, but they persisted and they were ahead of their time. And now look at it, you know, it's, it's still, I mean, unfortunately, organic almonds is less than 1% of the total crop is the reality. But um, there's, you know, millions and millions of pounds of organic now, whereas before it was just a couple hundred. So yeah. it's a growing movement, and um, we're doing everything that we can to grow the amount of organic acreage that there is of almonds. Um, but it's a slow process. Yeah. Uh, I think anyone in the organic industry will tell you that it's hard to move the needle. Yeah, absolutely. Especially with something For a variety like of reasons. almonds, I think, because organic almond butter in in retail ends up being like twenty dollars for a jar or something, whereas you know, organic peanut butter might be six or something. So there is like that premium yep. to organic almonds that's also probably causing some of the slowness because it's hard to really grow consumer demand when there's that, that big of a price difference. So have you seen or do you yep. foresee that as more of these organic almond producers come onto the market, that the price difference will also lower? I'm not sure. Um, the reality is that, you know, California is in a historic mega drought. Um, I want to say I saw some article that says we're in like a 1200 year drought, like the worst drought in 1200 years or something wow. crazy. Um, so there's, there's definitely a shortage of water and the way that most almonds are grown um, requires uh, more almond, more water than we care to admit. Um, so I just I want to be careful the way I talk about this because it's it's kind of a cliche mm -hmm. to say that well, almonds uses a lot of water. Yeah. It's it, it is true, and it doesn't need to be that way. So oh, okay. I like to reframe it by saying that. Uh, almonds don't have a water problem, they have a chemical problem. Mm. Let me explain what I mean. So 99% of almonds are conventionally grown. And so every single year in California, almonds are not only the most valuable crop in California, um, they are actually the most heavily sprayed crop as well. Oh, wow. okay. So every single year, there's over 40 million pounds of pesticides, herbicides, fungicides, fumigants sprayed on California almonds every single year, over 40 million pounds of all those different kinds of chemicals. And so what you're doing in, when you're spraying orchards with that much input is you're killing the soil. Mm. And when you're killing the microorganisms in the soil, the soil structure is not able to be uh, intact. And so you get what um, you get basically it's dirt instead of soil, right? So instead of having those nice um, soil organic matter aggregate clumps that are black and rich and store water and store moisture, um, you just get runoff. The water just runs right out. And so when 99% of almonds are grown this way in a way that kills the soil, you need a lot more water to irrigate those trees because you're just not hanging on to it like you would be if you had a healthy soil. And so they've actually done studies that show it can take up to 3.2 gallons of water per almond in these conventional systems to get, the, get enough water for the trees. And I don't have a specific um, number for how much less water organic needs, 
but I do know that for every 1% increase in soil organic matter, you can retain 20,000 gallons of water. So if we, if we talk about you know, using an organic system where you're building that soil organic matter, sheer, just by not having all those inputs, right? We're not even talking about additional practices that you can do. Surely by not killing the soil, you can, you can save like you know, 20,000 gallons of water per percentage of soil organic matter. That's amazing. So it's, you know, it's hard. It's like almost mind boggling, like how much less water you need when you farm organically with almonds. Yeah, that's really cool. So that's my, that's my uh, reframe on the water issue with almonds. I like it. Um, you know, and the truth is it, it is more expensive to farm in a way that promotes the flourishing of all life. And I don't think anyone should be ashamed of that. I think, um, we should actually view that as a good thing. We should, um, we should want to spend more money to promote the flourishing of all life, right? Not just you and me, um, but also the soil microbes, the, the bees that pollinate the trees, the trees themselves, they look happier when they're organically farmed. They don't look like they're on life support with nothing else living around them. Um, so I like to view it as a holistic investment in the well-being of all, of all creation. Um, but unfortunately, in America, it seems like um, we're, we're just a little bit used to cheap food. Um, I think the statistic is like we spend less than 10 percent of GDP on food on average, whereas other countries like in Europe, um, sometimes it can be above 20, 20 yeah. percent of their income every year goes to food. So, um, you know, the truth is that. There, there's a lot of data out there that shows that farming regeneratively, specifically in almonds, but I think this is true in general as well, uh, regenerative almond production tends to be 2x more profitable. Um, not only is it better for the bears and the bees and you and me and the trees, but um, it's also better for the farmer's wallet. And they've actually quantified this through research. You can actually look it up um, if you go to the Ecdysis Foundation's website. Uh, that's uh, e c d y s i s ecdysis foundation they're doing some amazing uh, pioneering peer reviewed research on regenerative almond production systems and I kid you not the benefits are in, intense and holistic so i just i encourage everyone listening to go to their website and check out their research and I think it's just a matter of telling that story um more and more so that people know that there's hard scientific data that shows that regenerative agriculture is holistically better, not only for the planet and people, but also for the, the profit. Yeah, that's great. That's, that's what I was going to say is we just need some studies showing how much more water organic soil retains or whatever for specifically for almonds. Um, Cause I, I did know that organic soil does hold more moisture and it captures more carbon and all that kind of stuff makes a lot more sense right and especially when it's regenerative um but i think part of our problem as a society is that we're not typically paying the true cost of almost anything we're paying like yeah you know you you buy clothing from these fast fashion places and you're buying a shirt for like five bucks that like there's no way that makes sense (laughs) like just the shipping alone you know it could be more than five bucks but but like you end up paying that price because of various subsidies because of you know tax breaks because of sweatshops because of whatever like there's so many things that have added Mm -hmm. bills that other people are paying like taxpayer or whatever else is kind of paying it so we complain about taxes yet we pay a lot of those taxes because a lot of the wrong way of doing things are subsidized whereas in my mind like how cool would it be if we just flipped it and said you know what from now on we're only going to subsidize or give tax breaks or you know whatever to the companies that are doing things the right way. Like if we subsidize regenerative so that that would bring that cost down, but then all of a sudden chemical farming is expensive because now you have to include not just or not just give up your tax breaks or your subsidies, but now you have to include the actual cost of all the damage you're doing to the environment, uh, the health problems that you're giving to all your workers and so on and so forth. Like if you looked at the true cost accounting of, of both methodologies, you would probably find that regenerative is actually a lot cheaper in the long run. Right. But because it's not a fair playing field, 
then you're putting it up to consumers who are already pinched because healthcare is crazy, housing costs are crazy, and you know inflation and you know the economic divide between the rich and the everybody else essentially just keeps growing. So you're asking those people who are just super pinched to pay this crazy premium to support what's right, when in reality it should be the system supporting the things that are right instead of giving tax breaks and incentives and whatever else to the people who are basically crapping on the planet and everyone in it, you know. But again, like we, the better for the world businesses not only have to do things in a more expensive way, but then you have to like pay for B Corp certification or USDA organic certification or all these things that continue to add expenses. And yet we're not getting all those tax breaks that the other people do. So of course the food or the clothes or the whatever are more expensive when it comes, when it reaches the shelf. But I feel like it's just unfair for us to be asking the consumers to have to pick up that bill in the short term. Sure. More affluent consumers can, but, but long term, I think we need to change the system. Yeah, I 100% agree with you. So, and I think the other piece that I would mention too is like, um, I think we need to quantify more about our food, yeah. right? So, part of our slogan is know thy foods, um, because if you are what you eat, then knowing your food is knowing yourself. And so, personally, I want to know everything that I possibly can about what I'm putting in my body because it's literally cellularly becoming mm -hmm. me. <laughs> Um, and so, you know, I want to know, and this is kind of like a, a passion project of mine is to try to figure out, um, how do we quantify, uh, everything that we possibly can about our food? So not just the, the macronutrition, like the calories and the protein and the fat, but what about other types of nutrients that are in our food, but aren't on the nutrition label, like polyphenols, like omega-3 fatty acids, um, I want to know about that stuff because I can guarantee you that the way that my almonds are farmed produces more of those beneficial compounds than, you know, almonds that are being strip mined in the soil and in the spray with a bunch of chemicals. Yeah. Um, so that's a, that's a gap in quantification that we have, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. We only measure a couple of things in nutrition facts when there's a lot more compounds that are vital to life that we're not quantifying. So we need to quantify those compounds. Similarly, there's a lot of anti-nutrients that don't make their way onto the label. Things like phytic acid, things like lectins, things like tannins, that the processing of sprouting and dehydrating helps to minimize some of these harmful anti-nutrient compounds. But we're not, we're not quantifying for that. We're not accounting for that. Um, so I wanna start you know, making that known. Um, also toxins, um, uh, one of the things that I'm hyper aware of personally is the toxin called glyphosate, which is the uh, active ingredient in the weed killer Roundup. Um, it turns out that glyphosate is the number one most intensively sprayed herbicide on the almond crop. And guess what? Uh, that's not allowed in organic agriculture. And so we've actually measured, we've measured the difference between our product and um, other organic almond butter products versus uh, conventional almond products. And every single conventional almond product that we tested had high levels of glyphosate residue um, above the 10 parts per billion safe threshold. And I'm putting safe in quotes because personally, I believe there's no safe threshold of this chemical. But, um, you know, it, it, is, um, it is present, unfortunately, in the organic products. It's, it's much lower than what we found in the conventional it's much lower than the 10 parts per billion safe threshold. It was down around two parts per billion that we measured. So it's there, but it's not even detectable according to the most uh, sensitivities of analysis. Um, whereas every single conventional one had it. And you know, glyphosate is a carcinogenic chemical. It's actually known to the state of California to cause cancer. It's a Prop 65 regulated substance. Why isn't this on the label of those conventional almond butters? I think that's a travesty. And in, in fact, it's, it's illegal in the state of California. The consumers should know that they are eating glyphosate when they're eating non-organic almond butter. So that's another thing that we need to quantify is the toxins that are ending up in our food as a result of those 40 million pounds of agricultural inputs that are being sprayed on almonds every year. And then finally, um, there's a lot of um, uh, non-agricultural 
uh, chemical contaminants such as lead, such as acrylamide. Uh, acrylamide is a great example of talking about almond butter because when you roast almonds, you actually generate acrylamide, uh, which is another carcinogen known to the state of California to cause cancer in humans. Um, why, why are the roasted almond butters not letting people know that they contain a carcinogenic chemical? So, you know, when we're talking about know thy foods, we really want to quantify and make, let people know the true picture of everything that's in their food so that they can make the most informed decisions possible about what to incorporate into their biology. Love it. Is that kind of woven into a lot of your, uh, website, social media, and all that kind of stuff as a strategy around um, letting people know. And I, I know education is a little bit difficult because people want to be entertained, right? But there's ways to kind of weave in uh, education and entertainment and recipes and inspiration and whatever. But but I feel like there is a lot of stuff that consumers should know. But then I also, I guess on the flip side, feel like consumers shouldn't even have to think about all this kind of stuff to some degree. It should just be the default. Food should be good food by default, and you should have to opt in to go eat your garbage Twinkie or something like that, just like cigarettes or other kind of poisonous industries. Why have we let food get so out of hand to where we are poisoning ourselves? Yeah. And like you said, Americans pay so much smaller percentage compared to other countries in, in like food costs, yet we pay so much more in healthcare. Coincidence? I think not, right? So it's if we just put more money into food and we ate better food, we'd be better off. But um, it's just also this can of worms that once you open it up, there's just books and books and PhDs worth of knowledge that you can gain in each of the subjects. And I feel like we're also just scratching the surface. Like there's some things about the microbiome that we're just starting to figure out and have an understanding for. So, um, so I appreciate you being out there kind of trying to plant the seeds, so to speak, and raise awareness for these things. But I also wonder, like, how are we going about doing that? Is it, again, are we putting the burden on consumers to be more informed? Are we going to try to get retailers to just stop carrying this stuff? Are we going to get laws passed, like what's going on in California, but nationwide? Like, how do we, how do we fix this problem on a larger scale? Yeah, well, for our part, you know, we're trying to make the on the glyphosate issue known. I don't know if you can see it on our logo, but we have the we're the first and only nut butter company to be certified glyphosate residue free. Nice. Um, so we're we're actually paying at least three times a year to have all of our products tested for glyphosate. And basically, what we're doing is proving that it contains no glyphosate above ten part per billion, which is the detectable limit. Um, so we do that three times a year. So we as a company are taking on an added cost to be transparent and prove to our consumer that these products are purer than the competition. Um, and so, you know, I've, I've kind of made it a, a pet peeve of mine because um, it turns out that my grandfather uh, died of um, non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, um, wow. stage four, advanced. All of a sudden it came out of nowhere. All of a sudden he was terminally ill. and when he was on his deathbed, what he said to me was, I'm afraid I've done myself in by spraying all these chemicals all these years without using protection. Mm. And later I learned that glyphosate is so strongly linked to non-Hodgkin lymphoma that it's actually been the um, billions of dollars of lawsuits that Bayer and Monsanto have lost and have had to pay out to victims of NHL. Uh, so for me personally, it's like, yeah, my grandfather might still be here today if he hadn't been using glyphosate, you know, without a mask. Um, so it's it's pretty personal. Yeah. And, you know, also I suffer from um, intestinal dysbiosis. And actually the way that uh, glyphosate works is it, it disrupts um, the gut microbiome because uh, it, it affects the shikimite pathway, which is something that doesn't directly affect humans, but it affects um, the microbes in our stomach. And everyone, most of us these days know that we rely on these microbes for 80% of our immune system and yada, yada, yada. So if we're disrupting that, um, it's going to be no bueno for our health. So for me, it's a, it's a passion subject. And I'm really grateful that uh, there are retailers, for example, um, Natural Grocers. Natural Grocers just recently updated their list of um, uh, banned substances to include glyphosate. Um, unfortunately, they're only applying it currently to 
uh, very notoriously high glyphosate crops like um, oats and legumes, uh, specifically lentils. But um, I want to work with natural grocers to let them know, hey, guys, we've done the testing and this, this 10 parts per billion glyphosate threshold that you're trying not to expose your consumer to, which thank you for doing that. That's super important. Let's actually apply that to all food. Because unfortunately, there's a lot of non-organic food out there that has higher than 10 parts per billion glyphosate in it. And we can, t- we can prove it through testing. And in fact, anyone of you out there listening can go to the store and test the organic versus the non-organic stuff for glyphosate or any other number of chemicals that you want to know about. So yeah, I, I really want to know who pays for this knowledge of our food. Because the truth is that a lot of these things are in our food and they're not being tested for. And so as a manufacturer, I'm happy to pay for glyphosate, but, you know, ultimately I want to know about all these other chemicals that I alluded to and anti-nutrients, but it's thousands of dollars of testing to figure out. So um, that's why I support the work of groups like the Bionutrient Food Association. My buddy Dan Kittredge is doing some really great work around uh, nutrient density quantification for food. And uh, he's developing a handheld scanner um, that you can actually take to the grocery store with you and scan one apple that's organic versus another apple that's not. And you can quantify through um, some sort of spectrometry how nutrient dense that apple is. Wow. And so if we're talking about leveling the playing field, right, this is a revolutionary device because it puts literally in hand of the consumer the power to know which food is nutrient dense and which food isn't. And so I I just want to put that out there that that could be another way that Relevels the market, right? Because if the consumer knows and can prove through a scan that one apple is better than another for them, why wouldn't they choose the healthier apple if they have the means to buy it? And so I believe personally yeah. that that would actually change the market dynamics to where, you know, the expensive food would actually be justifying its price scientifically based on how nutrient dense it is. And I think that's the direction that the food industry needs to go to actually prove the proof is in the pudding. This is more nutritious, that is less nutritious. This has more toxins, that has less toxins. And hopefully the selective pressure of the market would um, orient in the more nutritious, less toxic direction. (laughs) And um, yeah, hopefully that's where the consumer demand would go when consumers know what's actually in their food. Yeah, I'd like to say they would go that way. And I think there would be a percentage of... um people who do but i'm also like picturing all the people who gladly pound bags of cheetos or you know whatever else garbage processed food and like you could probably try to convince them that it's not good for them but they're also like meh (laughs) like what am i going to do about it so i think yes we need to make sure that people can find the more nutritious uh more nutrient dense foods but then we also need to work on our psychology as humans to try to do things that are a little bit better for ourselves instead of getting caught up in only doing the going with the path of least resistance or the immediate gratification or, and maybe it's also just like removing some of these more addictive kind of processed substances from our food instead of hoping that people will have good willpower. (laughs) Maybe we just need to not be putting that garbage on the shelf in the first place or something. I'm not sure, but but yeah, there's definitely a lot of work <laughs> that we as a species need to do to get our priorities right. But yes, in theory, you know, if Apple, Google, whoever the biggest phone manufacturers out there are listening to this right now, put that spectrometer on uh, the next generation of your phone so that we can just check our food out um, on the shelf as we're shopping. That would be amazing. <laughs> yes, please. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yeah. So... Philosopher Foods is coming up on, I think, about 10 years now of kind of going down this journey. What would have been maybe some of your biggest challenges to date? Yeah, I think, um, you know, it's, I like to say that we're offering some of the most delicious, nutritious, ethical, and ecological nut butter on the market. And, um, you know, a lot of people that have had our stuff know what i'm talking about it's it's amazing it's delicious um it's doing good for the world uh like i said that is it is more expensive to produce the highest quality food um so you know we're doing we're doing stone grinding in small batches um we're doing sprouting we're doing dehydrating 
all these different steps have all these great benefits um, to result in a superior product. However, it, it does make it more expensive. So, you know, it's it's been a bit of a challenge to um, communicate that value proposition, all those value propositions, and at the end of the day, get people to to pay what it costs to produce this superior quality nut butter. Um, so for us, a challenge has been, you know, scaling uh, rapidly, shall we say. You know, we, we are definitely not the cheapest <laughs> yeah. almond butter on the shelf. Um, we're one of the most expensive per ounce, not the most expensive, believe it or not, but um, <laughs> we're up there. And so in a system that, that you know, rewards cheapness because that's the only measure of value is how much something costs, we're, at, we're seriously disadvantaged by the way that capitalism is currently because, um, like I said, we're not measuring those other values. We're not measuring the nutrients. We're not measuring the antinutrients, the toxins, the chemical fertilizers and stuff that end up in our food. None of that's being measured. It's just, is it 1099? Is it 1999? It's just this one number. And that number isn't actually connected to any measure of uh, health or well-being. So, you know, it's that's that's constantly a challenge for us is dealing with a system uh, where what you measure matters. And if you don't measure it, it doesn't matter. And we're not measuring anything that matters right now. And so, um, yeah, yeah, that's a, that's been a big challenge. Hey, what if on retail shelves, instead of just the price per ounce, what if um, they had like a price per nutrients or something like that? And they could yeah. yours would actually end up being like. I don't know, a dollar per whatever, and the competitor might be like three dollars per whatever at that point. But again, yeah. like, is, are there kind of creative ways that we can use the power of data, like you, you're saying, to to flip the script and to change kind of what we're looking at and what we're valuing? Totally, I would love to know that. Um, <laughs> it'd be funny to have someone, oh, your your product is twice the cost of this other product, and I'd be like, yeah, but you need to eat three jars of that product to get the same amount of nutrients as our one jar, you know? So that, that would change the calculus completely. Yeah. Um, that's a, I would love to do that analysis. Um, but yeah, short of that, it's just, we're just kind of slogging it out and, um, you know, trying to, trying to make it as affordable as possible for as many people as possible. We're, we're trying to, you know, we have the eight ounce jar currently, um, we're actually moving it to a six ounce jar so that we can bring that price point down on the shelf. Um, you know, and it's unfortunate cause like, yeah, I'd rather have a bigger jar, but like if this is 1799 and this is 1379, uh, you know, this is under 15 bucks, which is kind of an important threshold in the shelf. <laughs> and like, if we could get this one down yeah, under 10, totally. like our, our regenerative organic certified coconut butter in this jar, is going to be nine ninety nine on Whole Foods. Then we're reaching a whole nother echelon of consumer. And so, you know, the more that we can get the SRPs down, it's just unfortunately the game we have to play in in food capitalism um, to be competitive yeah. with those cheaper products. Yeah, and I think especially the high price on the shelf is difficult when somebody hasn't tried your product and knows how much better it is, right? So even just swift shifting to the smaller jar. Even if somebody is less price sensitive and would be willing to pay more if they liked it, just giving them a lower entry point to to start to love the brand, I think is smart. I think that's part of why companies like I don't know, Justin's, not that they're wildly expensive or whatever, but like the little single serve pouches and stuff that are, you know, not the most sustainable packaging choice or anything like that. But it gives somebody a a way to try out the brand for a dollar or, or something like that, low risk, right? And then if they like it, they can yep. buy a bigger jar. And then if they really like it, they can go direct to your website and buy in bulk or sign up for a subscription or something that comes with a discount. So just giving people the opportunity to try it um, and fall in love with it, I think is a powerful tool. So I'll just add that not only do we face that problem at the consumer level, we also face that problem at the store level. Right. So even though we're perfectly aligned with someone like Natural Grocers, right? They're, we're like, we're regenerative organic certified for our coconut butters, soon to be our almond butters. We're glyphosate residue free certified. They just ban glyphosate. Um, even though we're like a perfect values match for them, 
they're afraid to touch our products because they're expensive. And, you know, um, I get it. Like from a capitalist perspective, you on that shelf, you're, you're a retail manager. You're like a, you know, you're a realtor. You're managing real estate. And so whatever's on that square inch of shelf, you want it to turn the most dollars per square inch possible uh, because you got expensive overhead to maintain that real estate. And so it, it's, it just puts us in an unsolvable challenge because here's the values aligned product but it's slower moving, it's more expensive. They're gonna make less money. They're gonna sell less product if they choose this compared to a cheaper non-organic nut butter that doesn't have these certs and values. Um, so yeah, I mean, I, need, I don't know how to get natural grocers to say yes to us. I don't know how to get Sprouts to say yes to us. They don't answer my emails. <laughs> they don't answer my sales guys' yeah. emails. When we had a broker, they didn't answer our broker's emails. And so, you know, I, they actually turned us down um, when we had the eight ounce jar. And so I was like, okay, well, I'm going to try to go in the six ounce jar now because then we're under 15 bucks. Maybe we'll have a shot at being on the shelf with these values aligned natural, national retailers. Um, so yeah, it's, it's definitely a, it's a challenging system to be in um, with, these, with these constraints. Yeah, for sure. I think there's, there's always the, it's difficult whichever path you choose to taking your product to market, whether it's uh, direct to consumer e-commerce or going into retail, there's always going to be these different barriers put up in front of you that shouldn't necessarily exist. Cause like you said, it's values aligned. It's, it's a great product. People, once they love it, will probably keep buying it, but it's, it is going to move a little slower. And like you said, retailers probably want to support brands like that, but they've also got to pay their own bills. And it's, it just becomes this, a uh, difficult situation to get in where you start feeling like you have to play the the market game even if you don't want to play the game like and and find all the different tricks that drive uh velocity or or like I was mentioning like coming to the coming to them with like a smaller price point small package super small package size or something like a dip their toe in the water that would just get consumers to try it but like there's all these tactics and whatever, but they're, those tactics aren't guaranteed and they could be expensive to pull off. Like if you had to do some trade spend or, or promos or whatever to get the price down. And there's just so many different things that you have to consider as a food company. And it's just difficult because your margins aren't, you know, gigantic to begin with. So it's definitely one of the challenges, I think, of growing a better for the world product company and a food company in particular is, is just fighting this whole cash flow price velocity like all these kind of challenges in a in a crowded market where your product may be the best and it may be the best for the world and maybe even the most delicious but still there's these barriers that are put up in front of you and how do you get over those like one thought that popped in my mind is if if you went the amazon route which what they would do in their early days to grow in a category is they would just sell products at a loss just to get people in the door and find the convenience of buying through Amazon and kind of take over a market. And then either the economies of scale caught up and they were selling enough to where that was no longer a loss, or once they'd put all the competitors out of business, then they could raise the prices back up and, and sell at a profit. But I was just thinking for like expensive almond butter, if it is something where if you were selling it at much larger volumes, you'd be able to get the price down. Maybe you'd be able to convince some. <laughs> Um, really kind of long for long term forward thinking venture capitalists or or investors or something like that to to invest in the growth now, take a short term loss so that you can get the volume up to the point where the cost does come down. Mm, totally. But again, there's so many random strategies and <laughs> I don't I don't know which ones make the most sense based on your business and the market and whatever, but I, I hear that, that that's a big challenge. You know, enough about all this, uh, how difficult it is to run a CBG business for a moment. Let's let's shift to the positive. Can you talk about some of uh, the wins that you're most proud of to date? Totally. Yeah, I would say um, subjectively um, and qualitatively, I believe that we've created some of the most delicious, nutritious, ethical, and ecological nut butter on the market. Um, and also we constantly have people telling us that we've ruined almond butter for them. (laughs) 
Um, so it seems like we've definitely done a good thing. Uh, like just the customer feedback and reception. Um, it's, it's really honoring to like basically get all this amazing feedback from people and how life changing it is, how amazing it is and how they can't eat whatever they were eating before because of what we're creating. So we have a lot that have given us really strong feedback. So that's been a huge win. And uh, I'd say quantitatively, um, we actually just got some spin data like two weeks ago. And it turns out we're actually the 12th best selling almond brand in the natural why happy about um, because you know, there's some big, like highly funded companies in those top 12. Um, and we don't even have, we like, we just got into UNFI um, like a month after that data was pulled. And so that was pre-distribution investment dollars. So I'm really excited to see what we can do once we get distribution and once we get some investment to put us on more of a level playing field with those other players in the top 12. And the other cool thing that we learned was of those top 12, uh, we were actually one of two brands in the top 12 that were growing. Um, all the other brands were declining in sales. Uh, so I felt, I felt like we must be doing something right if we're growing within a, a, a category that's otherwise shrinking. Um, so I'd like to believe that we're, we're sort of refreshing the almond butter category by bringing these yeah. um, high quality products. Um, we're trying to introduce the concept of craft nut butter, right? Like instead of, you know, Coors Light versus your local craft brewery. We're trying to do the same thing in nut butter. Um, so I feel like we're making headway, even though there's all these challenges and we're still small and blah, blah, blah. Um, it seems like we're really getting there. And finally, I'd say um, I'm really excited that we just launched our regenerative organic certified coconut butter yes. and chocolate coconut butter in Whole Foods awesome. actually this week. So I just got back from taking some shelfies um, <laughs> <laughs> last night at Whole Foods and You'll probably be seeing those on Instagram pretty soon. <laughs> That's cool. So, um, yeah, really excited to be able to be a, a pioneer in the regenerative movement and get some regenerative organic certified coconut butter out there on the market. That's amazing. Yeah, those are all huge wins, you know, like changing the landscape for a product category, getting people excited about what it can be, um, having some big like actual numbers to back up that people love this and want to buy it and and then you know also continuing to pioneer like there's some companies who come out of the gate do one cool thing and then they're done innovating <laughs> they're just like okay we did it now let's just grow <laughs> but i love what you're doing is like you're you're always just going to keep pushing forward right like so even though you've been in business for a while you're still kind of going after bigger and better you're still kind of pushing the agricultural system. You're still getting um, those certifications and so on and so forth. So that's awesome. I love it. Um, congrats on those achievements. So uh, maybe to wrap up a little bit, um, what would you say is the future for Philosopher Foods? Pying regenerative CPG brand. Uh, um, we're, we're looking at not only what does it look like on the ground with our supply webs to be regenerative in terms of the agricultural certifications, but um, also, what does it look like to create a regenerative culture in our business? How do we make this the most amazing place to work that we possibly can? How do we retain employees for 20 plus years? Um, and so, you know, really trying to focus on holistically, what does it mean to be a regenerative uh, CPG business? And we want to establish ourselves as a leader in that to show the industry really how it can be done so that hopefully other people can replicate it and it just becomes the norm for our industry. That's beautiful. I love it. Like, uh, not um, just a we're also product, but a regenerative business. That's, that's amazing. That's right. Yeah. I, I heard a definition from Carol Sanford actually about what regeneration is. And she said that regeneration is actually uh, essence expression. So whenever something can express its essence and fully actualize as a living being, whether that's a tree or a person or a frog, then that's the essence of regeneration. So I really, I've always loved that definition because it's so different than what we typically think of like, oh, it's good soil practices or, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. it's storing carbon in the soil or whatever. Um, it's so much more uh, holistic and qualitative than that. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm really excited to see how we can build that in our business. And 
um, I'll also say that I'm excited to get into other categories. You know, we, we've definitely made a name for ourselves in the nut butter category, and we continue to do that and keep pioneering that category. But we're also excited. We just rebranded last year to Philosopher Foods. Um, and so with that new rebrand, we're going to be focusing on things that are not just nut butters, but um, other types of regenerative products as well. So I'll be uh, excited to share that news and launch those products when they're ready. But um, yeah, I'm excited to really uh, get, get outside of our niches, get out there to make a bigger splash in the industry with our regenerative and helpful impacts. Nice. That's awesome. I love it. So it's uh, more, more food types, more impact, more kind of living into your purpose and expressing your true essence. So that's great. I feel like if every business or every person really could find space to live into their true essence, I feel like this world would be a magical place. So I feel like that's, that's a beautiful growth goal. So I love it. Great. Um, you know, what? I'm going to sneak in one last quickie question. So if you had one piece of advice to give anyone else following in your footsteps, what would that be? Uh, my initial instinct was to say, uh, think carefully and make a business plan before you jump. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, and again, I didn't do that. And I don't know if I, <laughs> I don't know if I would have made the jump if I did that. And so I think there's, there's a magic to both approaches. Um, you definitely need to be aware of what you're getting into, you know, like in terms of the industry and what it's like. Um, but maybe you don't want to know too much because, well, maybe, maybe you wouldn't take the leap. So it's a fine balance between uh, analytical and intuition and um, planning versus flying by the seat of your pants. And um, definitely, I think, been more in the latter categories, intuitive, <laughs> flying by the seat of my pants. And uh, in serendipities, we're still in business nine years later. I don't really know how that happened, but um, uh, it can happen. It can certainly happen. So I would just say at the end of the day, it's about listening to what your calling is and what your life's work is and trying to figure out whether you can actually express that through your chosen career path. And um, I feel like I've been able to do that so far. That's beautiful. Yeah, I totally second you in that kind of notion of, you know, it seems like a bad idea to jump in when you're looking back on it in retrospect and wishing you had done things a different way. But to your point, you wouldn't have jumped in if maybe you knew all the challenges. So I totally hear you there. I say jump in, but as soon as you possibly can start putting good strategies into place, right? Um, but don't don't overthink it, you know, if, if, if it's a beautiful idea, give it a shot, you know, rapid prototype, but be ready to pivot and be ready to make changes and be ready to go hard um, as soon as it starts working, because that way you can keep evolving it towards the better instead of replicating mistakes over and over again for years. <laughs> Which uh, that's what we're up to, right? Let's evolve CBG. We want to evolve yeah. CPG, right? That's the whole point of this podcast. We want to make this industry like will flourish, allow the planet to flourish. And our industry is perfectly set up to help enable that. So let's. Indeed, let's do it. Evolve CPG and therefore the world. That's the goal. So love it. I love what you're doing. Thanks for taking some time out of your schedule to share your wisdom with us and uh, looking forward to seeing where philosopher grows. So thanks again for doing what you're doing. And I can't wait to watch. Gas, love your content. Love your work. Thank you for doing it. Weaving the webs. Beautiful. Cheers. Thank you. Thanks for listening. If you'd like to learn more about Tim or Philosopher Foods, visit philosopherfoods.com. Subscribe to our podcast and YouTube channel for more innovator interviews, expert advice, and leadership discussions. If you like this episode, leave a heart, thumbs up, or review, and share it with your colleagues. As an ever-evolving show, we also love feedback, so send us your thoughts or ideas for who we should talk to next to evolve at modernspecies.com.